As you probably know by now, our theme on these Sangha nights um, has been um, great Buddhist texts, influential Buddhist texts. And for the last few weeks, we've been looking at um, great Buddhist texts of what's called the Mahayana, the, uh, the Mahayana wing, if you like, of, of Buddhism, the great way or the great vehicle. And we've been calling this uh, for the welfare of the world because the Mahayana puts great emphasis on practicing not just for one's own benefit, practicing the Dharma, growing, becoming, um, growing to our full potential, not just for our own benefit, but for the welfare of the world. So we've been looking at uh, texts from the Mahayana. And last week we heard from Satyajyoti about one of the really great figures of um, Mahayana Buddhism, the philosopher Nagarjuna, the founder of what's called the Madhyamaka school, the middle way school, Madhyamaka. So Sangharashtra says of Nagarjuna, by shattering the hard shell of literalism in which Buddhism was then imprisoned, Nagarjuna not only saved it from suffocation and probable death, but gave it room for future development. So, um, I mean, what, one of the things that can tend to happen with any spiritual tradition is it gets expressed, somebody has a, a great insight, a great experience, the Buddha had this great enlightenment experience, has to translate that into words. Um, and then those words get start to take on a sort of concrete literalism, and then the scholars get to work and they build a big construction on those words. And eventually you've lost sight of what it was all about and, it, uh, and those words get taken completely literally. Um, and when the words get taken completely literally, you're sort of stuck with a dead shell, which Nagarjuna, according to Sagarashta, liberated um, the tradition from. Um, he used words to show the limitation of words. Um, to show that nothing expressed in words can really get at the ultimate truth. And that includes even the teachings of Buddhism. We can't take them literally. We need to see through them to the truth beyond. And this week, I'd like to introduce two more figures um, who we might say, if Nagarjuna saved Buddhism from literalism, um, saved Buddhism from getting too bogged down in Nagarjuna's own very intellectual approach. Um, which in the wrong hands, you can use the Gajana's approach to deconstruct the Dharma, to show that um, nothing can be said about anything. So um, you can de deconstruct the teachings of Buddhism, there's nothing left, there's no higher values, there's no real meaning, uh, nothing, no Dharma in words that people could use to grow. So you can use the Dharma to create, you can use the Gajana's approach to, to actually um, Make a real mess of the Dharma for yourself, so that you've got you know you try to uh, uh, do without the words of the Dharma. So two figures who saved Buddhism from that so a nihilistic approach: Asanga and Vasubandhu. Um, who, who Asanga and Vasubandhu, who lived maybe um, 150 years after Nagarjuna. Um, um, were two of the key figures in what is in establishing what is called the Yogachara, the Yogachara school. So Yogachara means um, path of practice. Chara has got to do with chariots and cars, about moving the path into the way. Yoga uh, means practice, spiritual practice. In this case, it means meditation, actually. So it's a path of practice. And whereas Mad, um, Nagarjuna's Majjhimaka philosophy was based on a razor-sharp intellectual analysis, Asanga and Vasubandhu's Yogacara was based on actual experience, actual experience, especially actual experience in meditation, and actually, and especially actual experience of sort of visionary states. Um, it was, yes, it was based on higher states and deeper truths that we can experience in meditation and in visionary experience. And right down through the history of Buddhism to the present day, Nagarjuna's sharp intellectual approach and um, the Yogacara uh, experience-based approach, more imaginal, more visionary, have existed in a sort of creative tension. Um, 
they can be seen by some scholars as being in conflict, but in fact they complement each other. They're two sides of a coin. Uh, it's not as though one could be right and the other wrong. They're different approaches, and each balances out the flaws of the other. Um, the tradition needs them both, and I think we need them both, so that's why I'm going to talk a bit about it. So, Asango and Basabanda, they lived in what is now called Pakistan, uh, that sort of north eastern area of the Indian subcontinent, in what was then the Gandharan Kingdom, um, which was heavily influenced by Greek culture, actually. So, so they lived in the Gandharan Kingdom in the 4th century of the Christian era. <clears throat> and both Asanga and Vasubandhu became monks in the traditional schools, the traditional non-Mahayana schools in two different schools. But fairly early on, Asanga converted to Mahayana, to the Mahayana form, uh, form of Buddhism, and he began writing texts, really voluminous texts, based on his experiences, um, that were the foundation of the Yogacara. But um, Vasubandhu wasn't <coughs> impressed. Vasubandhu really wasn't impressed by his brother and his conversion to this new new style of Buddhism. Um, Vasubandha, in fact, said, poor, poor, what did he say? I'm going to somewhere. Um, <laughs> poor Asanga, poor Asanga. He's lived alone in the wilderness, meditating for 12 years, and all he's got for his pains is enough rubbish to break the back of an elephant. I think he was referring to Vasubandha's text that he was writing. It was, uh, it was enough rubbish to break the back of an elephant. So, um, traditionally, uh, well, it's said that Sangha was really concerned about that because he thought that this would be very bad karma for uh, Vasubandhu to um, go around saying things like this. So he better, for Vasubandhu's sake, he better convert him. So he, um, slightly dubious, this, he put it about that he was ill. So this must be skillful means, because we do have a precept about truthful speech. But anyway, he put it about that he was ill and that Vasubandhu should rush to his bedside. Uh, so Vasubandhu apparently rushed to his bedside and um, Asanga taught him uh, the Mahayana. And um, he was converted. He was converted and very concerned. And in fact, he uh, is said to have um, been so upset by what he'd said in derogatory terms about the Mahayana and about the Yogacara, that he uh, wanted to cut out his own tongue. And, um, but he was convinced by a Sangha not to cut out his tongue because he could use his tongue to spread the Dharma. So he didn't cut out his tongue. So uh, happy ending. Um, and we're told that uh, they came in their realization, they came to equal each other two of them. Uh, they wrote loads and loads and loads and loads of texts. Um, among the ones I could pick out, Asanga wrote a thing called the Yogachari Bhumi Sastra, Shastra, which means the um, discourse on the stages of, part of the path of the Yogacara, or the discourse on the stages of the path of practice. Um, Vasubandhu wrote um, the Vinyaktimatra Sastra, Shastra, which means the discourse on consciousness only. And I'll say more about consciousness only later. Loads more as well. So as we've heard, uh, Asang was a great meditator. Um, we heard Vasubandhu taking the mickey out of him and saying he meditated alone in the wilderness for 12 years. Um, so the tradition does tell us that he meditated in a cave high in the mountains alone for 12 years. And what we're told is that during this meditation, during these 12 years, he, um, he visited, he had access, he gained access to a higher realm, a visionary realm called the Tushita Heaven. And in that realm, he met Maitreya, the future Buddha. And Maitreya taught him. He received... He met Maitreya in the Tushita heaven. Um, and Maitreya taught him. Maitreya taught him the, the Yogacara. That's where the, that was the source of his writings on the Yogacara, that he was being taught 
um, by Maitreya. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, according to, I mean, it, it's quite uh, common in, in Mahayana Buddhism, this idea that we can actually access higher levels of reality in meditation. And that visiting the Tushita heaven, if you like, is a sort of imaginative way, a mythic way of describing a higher level of reality, the future where the future Buddha Maitreya is said to dwell, um, teaching the Dharma to anyone who has access to that level. Um, so a Sangha does seem to have contacted a source of deep wisdom and clear vision that wasn't available to him in his normal state of mind um, when he wasn't meditating. And this deeper wisdom, this higher state of mind, was the source from which his writings and his teaching flowed. And then these writings and these teachings, they breathed new life into Buddhism. They had a profound impact on many, many cultures, uh, especially Tibet and Far East, and on countless people um, down the ages, and we're still talking about them, because that's what we're doing tonight. Um, instead, there is another story about a Sangha and his uh, 12 years meditating, and in this story, a Sangha did indeed spend 12 years meditating in a cave high in the mountains, seeking to break through into that higher level of reality, seeking to contact Maitreya, and Absolutely nothing happened. Absolutely nothing happened. For 12 years, he got nowhere. And during these 12 years, several times he gave up. He thought, this is a waste of time. I'm going home. And he started off going down the mountains. And just when he got to the sort of edges of civilization, before he got to civilization, something would happen that persuaded him to persevere. So maybe he would fall asleep on his way down, he'd have a dream. And in a dream, a bodhisattva would appear to him and say, don't give up now, go back up the mountains. Or um, he, would, um, he would be meditating and he'd get guidance in meditation. He'd think, no, no, I must go up. Or he'd meet, he'd meet this mysterious old woman who would sort of poke him with a stick and say, get back up your mountain, man, get back up your mountain. Something would happen. Something would happen to make him get back up his mountain. But at the end of 12 years, he completely had enough. He had had absolutely enough. Um, obviously, he'd been folding himself. He'd been knocking on a door that wouldn't, wasn't going to open, uh, a brick wall. So he left his cave and he started walking back down to the lowlands. Um, and then we're told on the, first, on the outskirts of the first town he came across, just as he was about to re-enter civilization, um, he came across an old she-dog in a terrible state, in a terrible state. She'd been badly injured and her wounds were crawling with maggots. And coming straight out of a long period of meditation, as anyone will know who's done this, coming out of a long period of meditation with all the sort of sensitivity and empathy that that gives you, this was absolutely unbearable to him. He couldn't stand to see this dog suffering. <clears throat> He was overcome with compassion, uh, desperate to do something to help this dog. But at the same time, he couldn't bear to kill or harm the maggots either. So what we're told is that he knelt down and pre prepared to transfer the maggots from the dog's wound to the ground with his tongue. So he knelt down and what he saw was so horrible, so horrible he couldn't possibly look at it. So he closed his eyes. So he closed his eyes and he stuck his tongue out experimentally, <laughs> feeling for a maggot. And suddenly there was this great ringing in his ears. There was this great ringing in his ears. And he opened his eyes and there before him was blazing with golden light. In all his glory was Maitreya. The dog was Maitreya. Um, and this should have been cause for great rejoicing, surely. But apparently Sangha was in fact a bit peeved. So he said, hey, Maitreya, I've just spent 12 years meditating in the cave, seeking to, uh, seeking, dedicated, dedicatedly meditating on you, and not a glimmer of yourself did you show. And now, while I'm in, not in a higher state of meditation, but doing something completely disgusting, you appear to me. 
And Maitreya answered, I was with you all the time. I was with you all the time, but you couldn't see me because you did not have great compassion. <clears throat> so obviously, we're not meant to take this story literally. Okay? We're not meant to take the story literally. It's a story to make a point um, with a bit of humor added in. But it does make a point. So Maitreya, the future Buddha, represents the higher level of consciousness that Asanga was trying to attain. He represents the enlightened wisdom he was trying to access. Uh, but Maitreya, the future Buddha, is the loving one. His name means the loving one. That's what it means. It's got uh, Maitri is the root of it. Maitri is uh, Sanskrit, metta. Metta is the Pali word. It means the loving one. It means the being of Maitri, the being of metta. The future Buddha is the being of metta, the being of Maitri. If we want to connect with our potential for deeper wisdom and the, that the future Buddha represents, if we want to raise our level of being to the point that that wisdom can talk to us, if we want to connect with our own potential to become a Buddha, we can't do that without cultivating metta. The name of the future Buddha is Maitreya. We can't do it without metta, we can't do it without compassion. And I think that's a really important thing to take on board because it's precise, trying to become enlightened without compassion, without metta, is precisely what quite a lot of Western Buddhists seek to do. Um, try to get enlightened, have deep insight without cultivating metta. We can be very clever and understand the teachings of the Dharma at a rational level. We can be very attracted to the cool spaciousness of meditation, of mindfulness of breathing, just sitting. Um, and we can want to get on as soon as possible to the insight practices, the real thing, the insight practices, um, to open the door to enlightenment. But maybe we find meta difficult. Maybe the meta bhavana seems difficult to us. Coming from our cultural background, may maybe meta doesn't come easy. We don't want to think about other people. Um, we want to get straight on with cultivating insight for ourselves, not bothering with practices like the metta bhavana. But that ain't going to work. That's what the story is telling us. That is not going to work. We'll just be fooling ourselves, knocking at a door that isn't going to open. Maitreya might be there all the time, but he will stay completely hidden from us unless we have compassion, unless we have metta until we feel strong empathy and love for others. Develop a warm heart of metta. Anyway, that's a bit of a side tangent. Going back to the story, uh, it's not, that's not a story that's to be taken literally, but what is clear is that Asanga meditated for a very long time, somewhere very remote. The tradition says 12 years. Um, he spent years in intense meditation and he did access a realm of higher consciousness during his meditations. Um, and the insights he received there formed the basis for many of his writings and teachings that were so influential in establishing the Yogacara tradition. The tradition talks about in this mythic, imaginal way in terms of him visiting this higher visionary realm receiving teachings from the future Buddha. So we get the great Chinese, you know, we know he existed from his works. We also know he existed from the great Chinese traveler monk, Xuan Song, who um, wrote about it, writing about his visit to northern India. He said, in a great mango grove five or six leagues to the southwest of the city of Ayodhya, there is an old monastery where Asanga Bodhisattva received teachings and guided the common people. At night, he went up to the realm of Maitreya Bodhisattva in the Tushita heaven to learn the Yogacara. Uh, in the daytime, he lectured on the marvelous principles he had discovered to a great audience. <clears throat> so. And this fact, this fact that, my, that Asanga is uh, said to have been taught the Yogacara teachings during meditation, in a higher visionary realm uh, where he met the future Buddha, Maitreya. All, this tells, all that tells us something important about the Yogacara itself. It tells us something about, about the Yogacara. Because the Yogacara is the path of practice, especially meditation practice. 
And for the Yogacara, the experiences we have in meditation are just as real as the experiences we have while we wander around the streets, while we wash up, while we cook dinner. Uh, the experiences we have in meditation are just as real. In fact, the experiences we have in deep meditation, in visionary experiences, are more real. There is more truth in them. Uh, because they belong to a higher realm of reality. So we could ask ourselves, okay, which is more real? Which is more real? A Sangha's meditation experiences of being taught by Maitreya in the Tushi to Heaven, or a Sangha's old dirty sandals and his old black cooking pot, which are sort of things you can kick. You can't kick his meditation experience. You can kick his cooking pot. Just the fact that you can kick his cooking pot, make it real, and the other not. Um, many people today would say that his sandals and his cooking pot are real, but the meditation experiences he had were just caused by disturbed brain chemistry or some, some such. Um, but Asanga's meditation experiences enriched whole cultures, affected the lives of millions of people, trans totally transformed the lives of many people, um, they still affect us now. Who cares about his sandals? Um, so the Yogacara tells us that visionary meditation experiences like the ones that Asanga experienced are in fact manifestations of something real. In a sense, more real than the surface material world uh, that we sort of assume is all there is often. Um, so according to the story of Asanga and Maitreya, the truths of the Yogacara came from meditation experience, um, from visionary experience, from the heights and depths of the mind. But to the materialist, this talk is called Beyond Materialism, to the materialist, such experiences are just in the mind, just in the mind. But for the Yogacara, there is no just, there's no just. These are experiences in the mind and the mind is real. The mind is real. To the materialist, and I mean materialist now in the, in the philosophical sense. We can use materialist in quite a sort of loose sense as somebody who likes stuff, who likes shopping, you know. Sort of person who feels really at home in meta all that, a materialist. But a philosophical materialist is somebody who believes that really only matter is real. Only matter is real. Um, that consciousness is just a sort of delusionary flim-flam vapour produced by sort of brain chemistry. Um, and to somebody who holds that view, a Sangha's old dirty sandals are real and his meditation experiences are not. Um, but as I've said, you know, there's a huge difference in the significance of them. Some of them are significant and the, uh, the Sangha's aren't. Um, so, okay, the Yogacharic teachings that Asanga and uh, Vasubandhu produced are huge. They're huge. They cover a huge area about the nature of mind, the different levels of the mind, massive documentation of different mental states and how they fit together, um, the nature of faith, stages of the path, and so on. Vast, vast writings. But tonight, I'd just like to explore one really fundamental aspect of Yogacara, which is what I've been talking about, the value it places on experience, and especially on mind, on consciousness, on meditation experience. So, very often, in Tibet, for example, the Yogacara goes by another name. The two names are used interchangeably. And that name is Chitta Matra. Chitta means mind, thought, heart. Um, according to Sangharachita, it means both mind and mind and heart. Uh, matra means only. So that's mind only. Mind only. Um, now, it's not true, really, that Yogacara and mind only are completely synonymous, and some people try and reframe it to experience only, which I'm fine with. But the fact is that... Um, in many, many uh, manifestations of Yogacara, mind only and Yogacara are seen as synonymous traditionally. 
Um, so, for example, in one of the most influential Yogacara Sutras, the Lankavatara Sutra, the Buddha is, is reported as saying, my teaching is based on the recognition that the objective world, like a vision, is a manifestation of mind itself. Or in the Dasabhumika Sutra, we are told, all three worlds exist in the mind. They are mind only. Um, according to Sangrachta in his survey of Buddhism, Vasu Bandhu's, well, this is a quote, his best known work, the Tri Simchika Vinyati Matrata, is mainly an attempt, whew, is mainly an attempt to show that there is no such thing as material substance and that only ideas exist. What they saw in these higher states of consciousness, in their meditation, was that nothing existed but mind, that all things were in reality mind, and that mind was all things. So we seem to be told here that what is ultimately real is not matter, it's not the stuff we can kick. What's real is mind, consciousness. And this probably is like, what? Can't do that, can't do that. Some analogies maybe would help. A dream, a dream. We experience, depends on how vividly you dream, but it's possible to have dreams in which it is totally convincing. There is stuff, there are tables, there are people, there are all sorts of things. They really, you know, they're out there, they're, they're our outer experience. And where are they? They're just in the mind. They're in the mind. Um, another, another perhaps analogy would be a virtual reality, like as people experience in the film The Matrix. So in The Matrix, um, people trapped in The Matrix experience a perfectly convincing world where the things around them seem solid and real, but the whole environment is in fact a mental construction. It's a, a apparently real experience. Uh, things are just, just experience. There's no existence of their own. The Matrix one is probably a better analogy than the dream because in the Matrix it's a shared reality and I don't think anyone was ever saying that uh, you lot are just in my mind, for example. You know, if we all have different mental realities it would be very um, odd. We clearly share a reality. But maybe though, so you know, we mustn't take analogies literally either any more than we must take teachings, but they might give us a sense of what um, how it could not be completely absurd, yes. how, you know, I mean, isn't it just absurd to save everything in the mind? The idea that the world we live in is created by the mind. In fact, um, that is what many Western philosophers have thought. I mean, there's a whole school of Western philosophy called idealism, not, not the usual meaning of idealism. So one very famous idealist philosopher was Bishop Berkeley, Berkeley who said, Everything is, everything is an idea in the mind of God, for example. Um, it might seem strange to us, if, but if we're willing to put aside our common sense notions for a while, we'll see that it's actually not absurd. After all, the only thing that you and I have really know exists, the only thing we know exists is our consciousness. We know that exists. Now, we deduce the nature of matter. Because things seem to be there, you know, you, you try and catch them out by turning the light on really quickly. And they're still there. So, um, yeah, probably matter does exist, you know, and, and you sort of it's predictable in a certain sort of way. So we deduce the experience of matter. But isn't it rather odd to think that the one thing we know exists is somehow less real than the thing that that very consciousness that we know exists deduces? Isn't there something quite contrary about that? If that makes any sense. <clears throat> so our awareness is somehow less real than an abstract concept of matter that that, awa that awareness has created. So, you know, you get people like the eminent 20th century philosopher Bernard Russell in his book, he's in the Problems of Philosophy, he says, those who are unaccustomed to philosophical speculation may be inclined to dismiss such a doctrine as obviously absurd. There is no doubt that common sense regards tables and chairs and the sun and the moon and material objects as something radically different from minds and the contents of minds, as having an existence which might continue if minds cease. 
We think of matter as, as having existed long before there were any minds. But idealism is not to be dismissed as obviously absurd. It must be admitted that we can never improve the existence of things other than our experiences. In dreams, a very complicated world may seem to be present, and yet on waking we find that the sense data in a dream do not appear to have corresponded with physical objects. And he, in fact, goes on, very many philosophers, perhaps the majority, have held that there is nothing real except minds and their ideas. So, common sense. Common sense, I think, uh, somebody, uh, was it? Somebody described common sense as the inherited stupidity of the race. Um, you know, so it's quite good for survival. But. Anyway, apparently the mind-only idea is reasonable enough that even a really eminent astrophysicist, um, Sir Arthur Eddington, Ed, Eddington, can say, the stuff of the world is mind stuff. The mind stuff of the world is something more general than our individual minds. We might think of its nature as not altogether foreign to feelings in our consciousness. Anyway, he goes on in that manner. But so, you know, if you know much about modern physics, you'll realise that this sort of machine world that we are indoctrinated to believe in is, A, out of date in terms of modern physics. And um, it's sort of like a GCSE level understanding of 19th century science, really. Um, <clears throat> We tend to think of it as scientific. Anyway, this idea, this idea that um, mind might be more fundamental than we tend to think, um, there's actually a great deal in early Buddhism which would seem to support the Yogacara on that. So we have the, the very first words of the Dhammapada reckoned to be one of the absolutely central teachings of the Buddha experiences are preceded by mind, led by mind, and produced by mind. Um, then we've got the ideas, of, Buddhist ideas of different levels of being and rebirth. So the Buddhist idea of rebirth is not that we sort of get punished by being born a frog or being born a chicken or something. It's the idea that we, the world that, manifest, that we manifest around us is a reflection of our state of being. And we see that in the, in the Wheel of Life, the different realms of the Wheel of Life, if you know about them. They are manifestations of states of being. So the state of being and the, the inner, the state of being and the outer world are sort of reflections of one another. Very, very common, normal idea within, um, within uh, early Buddhism as well as later Buddhism. But, okay. I'll express a personal view here, despite the fact that uh, mind only is a perfectly reasonable doctrine, um, I think it's really difficult to argue that it's in any sense absolute truth. Okay? I think it's really difficult to argue that it's absolute truth. Um, there's a little bit in the Pali Canon where I think it's um, Shari Putra talking, and he talks to somebody about uh, what's called name and form and consciousness, which I take to mean roughly material and mental existence. And he talks about them leaning together like two sheaths of uh, two sheaves of wheat or something. That they hold each other up, they can't be separated. Um, I reckon that um, well Imagamika, a follower of um, such Jyoti's Nagarjuna would say, ha, mind, ha, matter. Mere play words. You've just, all you've done is separate out experience and you've, you've got one abstract thing and another abstract thing. And you can say that one's first or that one's first. That is rubbish. All there is is what is. They're just words. They're just abstract concepts. Where is your famous mind? Show it to me. Um, can you tell me its, its characteristics? Mind is just an abstract concept. Um, so I, I think I think that the Pucker Buddhist belief position is that mind and the external world come arise. They're two sides of a coin, they can't be separated. Not that one causes the other, but that they just are two sides of the same coin. So, okay, big discourse here on, so we've had a sort of discourse about difficult philosophical issues. Now usually somebody in the audience of this, maybe you, is thinking 
What on earth does this matter to me? How does this affect my life? What has this got to do with practicing Buddhism? Well, it does, actually. Because how we see the world directly affects the way we live our life. How we see the world determines the way we live our life. The way we see the world is the map we use to navigate through life. Um, use a different map, the paths we take will change. And the thing is that most of us never even think about the way we see the world. We've been, you know, we got it from our parents, we got it from school, we got it from our culture. Um, we just take it for granted that the way we've been taught and conditioned to see the world is the way things are. We never actually make ourselves aware of our underlying unconscious assumptions about the nature of things. Um, so the way we live our life is determined by a load of assumptions we've picked up unconsciously and never really thought about. So we live on automatic pilot, completely conditioned by our past. And to break free of that, we actually need to look at our views. We need to look at our underlying assumptions about the nature of things uh, and examine them. We need to think. It's really difficult, but we have to think. Um, and we can probably assume that the world view we've been conditioned to accept is completely and utterly wrong, right? The Buddha said, worldlings have see, them, see things upside down. It's just their views are upside down. They're just completely deluded. Um, so it's quite worth just having a, having a think about that. And most of us in this day and age, I mean, people have had all sorts of different conditionings in different ages, but most of us, unless we've had a religious upbringing, unless we've managed to avoid being taught any science, have been strongly conditioned to think that matter is what is really real, and that the mind is just a sort of vapour created by brain chemistry, and that uh, meditation experiences are just sort of something that happens and you can see on a brain chart or something. Um, but this, this leaves us, this, this is the machine world, this is the world as a machine. So it's the world of the 19th century where they were really into machines, so they envisage the world as a machine. And then we live in this machine world where everything's dead, and it works like a machine, and mind is not really there. This leaves us in a dead world in which there can be no real meaning, in which our experiences of beauty must be delusion, um, any significance must be delusion. It's a world where there's no real scope for spiritual transformation. Um, if the world is a machine, and you're a machine, and I am a machine, well, you know, we can kid ourselves by doing a bit of meditation, but how are we going to change? We're just, gonna, we're just machines. How are we going to change? You know, you can make your computer do as much meditation as it likes. There's never going to be anything other than a computer. Um, and this is a very boring world indeed, and it's a very boring life it leads to if we really, if we really go down that road. If that is our worldview, we really aren't going to believe in our heart of hearts that it's worth putting that much effort into spiritual development. Because we won't see that there's real potential for spiritual development. <coughs> and Sang Rajna, I mean, Sang Rajna has pointed out this is mainly how contemporary Westerners see the universe around us, as something dead and lifeless. And he has, he has said this, he has described this worldview as pathological. It's an illness. Uh, and he said that such a world is not a world in which you could get enlightened. And he actually compared it unfavorably with the way that supposedly primitive people um, see the world, which is a, a living thing full of magic and wonder and meaning. So, I don't think mind only really, uh, we can, I don't think we can really say mind only is absolute truth, but mind only might be a much better basis for a spiritual life than matter only. Um, it's a doctrine, I think, that can be very helpful to us, especially if we've been conditioned to think in materialist terms. I think it's really worth experimenting with thinking differently, with thinking more like the world is a dream, a vision, etc. Um, it will free us up from the sort of mind manacles of a materialist, uh, dead world machine view. 
consciously using our imagination to see the world through the lens of mind only, could help to bend the straw the other way. The straw is heavily bent towards materialism. To get it back to the middle, we might have to yank it to the other way and get it to stand up right. So that we're less dominated by a view that causes us to see the world as a dead machine and us as ourselves as machines. So allowing ourselves to see the world as a place of living mind rather than dead matter, I think it can have a number, a, a number of really big benefits for our spiritual life. For a start, we'd be much more open to meditation experience. In the dead machine world, not much can really happen in meditation. And if it does, it's probably just a sort of imbalance of brain chemistry. Um, but not only in meditation, but our growth in a, in a, in a world where, where mind is central, more central, the potential is endless. The poten we can't see the potential. We can't see the end of our potential. Um, in our meditation practice and our practice in general, what we could become becomes uh, becomes beyond our imagination. In our life, we'd be more open to beauty, wonder, and awe, which if we live, think we live in a dead machine world, we tend to go, oh, well, that's just, can't be true. Can't be real. It's just a machine. Uh, but if we live in a world of um, where mind is important, where awe, wonder, meaning, beauty, they're inherent in the nature of things. If we thought more in these terms, we'd stop looking for happiness from material things quite so much, because we would see they're a bit illusory. It would be much clearer to us that happiness and fulfillment must be sought by changing our mind. Um, so we'd be much more wholehearted in our practice. If we saw the world in this way, many of the dharmic ideas that, that seem nonsense to a materialist, if we're, if we're conditioned to be materialist, rebirth, the British idea of rebirth, cannot make any sense whatsoever. Um, if I'm, you know, I mean, if my mind is just a product of some, brain, of some chemi chemicals in my brain, then when that brain goes, my mind goes back. But if mind is much more central to the nature of things, well, rebirth starts to... Uh, uh, not look so daft after all. Um, so yeah, lots of lots of ideas of Buddhism would become much more plausible to us. And the idea of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas that we can't see but who exist on a mental plane that we can contact in meditation, that would also be seen as perfectly possible. The idea that there are visionary realms that we can visit in meditation, which is actual experience. And one thing I like about the yoga chariot is it's based on actual experience. People experience these things. Um, but what we often tend to do um, as Westerners, we have this idea and we discount our experience. We absolutely discount our experience. It can't possibly tr be true that uh, visionary experience is, is real because we've got this fixed model in our head. So I think just <coughs> relaxing our, um, yeah, our pre... Uh, prejudged ideas of the nature of the world to allow more scope in would be a really good idea and uh, a bit of yoga chara might help with that. Thank you.